All right. And we are live with people coming in. Awesome. Here we are. What's up, everyone? Michael here with Company Cam, uh, joined by a good friend in the industry, not just an expert in the industry, but a good friend, Benji Carlson uh, with Breakthrough Academy. Uh, Benji, thanks so much for jumping in with us today. It's good to see you, Gogan. I am uh, I always enjoy these hangouts, man. So this will be fun. Absolutely. I, I love the topic that we're going to get on today. Um, so as people are kind of coming in here, um, obviously they know what they're in store for, but we're going to talk project management roadmap for contractors. And specifically, you know, we're going to kind of have some dialogue back and forth on how we can help these contractors scale mm -hmm. past eight figures. So I, mm -hmm. I, I think it's going to be a great conversation back and forth. Uh, while we're letting people get in here, let's go over just a few housekeeping things. Uh, in Zoom, you guys are probably all familiar with that now, um, but you can see in the bottom of your Zoom, there is chat. Uh, so if you want to practice the uh, chat piece and let us know where you're joining us from or what trade you're in, just give that a practice. And then there's also a Q&A down there as well. So if you have a specific question throughout, um, the presentation for Benny or for Benji, sorry, for Benji, we will make sure that we get that answered. Um, I'm going to see all of those questions if they're in the Q and a, and I'll just kind of see how the conversation is going and either interrupt Benji and say, Hey, Benji, we got a great question, or we'll kind of save that to the end, but we'll make sure you get all your questions uh, that you guys have answered. So with that, um, you know, we got a nice number of people here. Um, already with us benji let's let's go ahead and kick this thing off um you know maybe just give any everybody like that quick high level of who benji is what breakthrough is um sure speak to your expertise and then okay. we'll get into the uh how to how to scale your business on the project management thing so hey everyone uh hey nick uh hi all 57 of you nice to see you welcome uh my name is benji and i guess uh, let me just tell you a little, like very briefly about Breakthrough Academy, because I think that the rest of this conversation will make a bit more sense if you understand where it sort of comes from in the first place. So um, we're, we're obviously partners with with Company Cam. Um, we are not a, a photo storage app. We are not a piece of software. We are, uh, the best way to describe it would be business systemizers. So we help contractors implement a management system into their company that helps them scale. And there's a lot that goes into that from financial tracking and annual budgeting to how people design their organizational structure to their recruiting and hiring systems. Obviously finding people is harder than it's ever been. So we do a lot of work on employer brand and, and, and a business's ability to attract the people that it needs. Uh, we implement training and onboarding systems. It's all of the behind the scenes sort of operational stuff that when you first start your business, you're not really that worried about. But then when you kind of hit the million dollar a year mark, maybe even a little higher, that's when you really start to feel like, okay, this this business needs infrastructure um, or it's, it's, it's not going to get to where it deserves to go. And so we come in behind the scenes we work with entrepreneurs we help them implement and we watch their businesses grow as a result so that's what breakthrough academy does um i do uh i wear a few different hats on sort of like the sales and marketing and content side of of our our business i host a podcast called contract revolution um we do a bunch of other stuff as well this this project management conversation gogan has um the reason we've kind of built this 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 uh these resources and 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 created this this conversation is just out of a need like we've just been pay pretty close attention to what our members are saying and this project management thing seems to be seems to need some demystifying for a lot of business owners it seems to be a very weak element I'm not going to say for everyone, but for a lot of contractors, I think it's quite a weak part of their business. And it's a, um, once it gets fixed, once it gets cleaned up, there's a lot of things downstream of that, that become much easier revenues. It's easier to scale. Your business becomes more profitable. Your people are less stressed out. Your customers are better communicated with. Um, and so I think that this is, this is a good, this is a key that a lot of people want to unlock 
in their business. Yeah, let's well, let's start there. If it's you know, obviously you guys created content and conversation around the topic for a reason. Uh, but when, when we're specifically talking about constructions and these you know home service trade contractors, mm-hmm. kind of have two elements. You've got the process piece of project management, and you have the human element of project management. Let's start with the the process piece of it. Why is it such a difficult piece? to master in your business, that project management piece of your business? Why is that so hard for contractors to master? Okay. So here, here's the deal. Um, in construction and trades, like in our little, in our little world here, the, like the actual term project management or project manager, right. Has become very watered down. And if you talk to any project manager in a business, most of them, if they're being real with you, are going to tell you that behind the fancy title and the company truck, they're essentially just a professional firefighter, right? They're, they're doing their absolute best um, with the resources that they have. They're trying their hardest, but more often than not, they're essentially running from one fire to the next. So they're their PMs, their project managers in title. It says that on their business card, but it it they're, they're not project managers um, in practice. Now, here's here's what's inter- here, here's why that is right. The the principles of project management are are totally universal. You can use these to organize uh, you know your kid's carpool to a soccer tournament, or you can use them to organize a I don't know two point five billion dollar airport expansion. Um, so it's a system, it's a practice, it's a craft that you can, that you can master. It's not just something that you throw on a business card because it looks good to clients. So while these principles have been absorbed by other big industries, um, aerospace, uh, big tech, oil and gas manufacturing, et cetera, they've not really made their way into construction and trades for whatever reason, um, and that's so there's a big gap, like these best practices, these guiding principles, um, the SOPs, the process for how to do this. So keep in mind, everyone, like you can you can literally get a master's degree in project management, right? You, this, this is something that you, it's, it's quite academic. You can you can absolutely get educated and get better at this. But I think that there's a I think that construction and trades is very underserved when it comes to high quality education and tools and resources around this. Um, so th- I think, I think, I think that that is probably a, a really good place to start when you, when you, when you want to think about why this is the way that it is, it's like other sectors of the economy are, are leaning into project management heavily. Whereas we're, uh, like with a lot of things, construction and trades is, is just a little bit, is a little bit behind, but catching up very quickly. And I think if that resonates with you, if you're like, Oh, I know what he means. Let us know in the chat box if if it does. The rest of what we're going to talk about today is, is we're going to give you a few pieces to the puzzle. Not everything. It's a one hour conversation, but let's let's give you some low hanging fruit on how to move the needle in the right direction. Yeah. So with with that answer, you know, you talked about the the title on a business card, the the company truck. How yeah. how do how do I get that person that truly is cut out to be an excellent project manager uh is it potential that i already have them and i'm just not giving them the right processes and tools um or what what do what do i need to be looking for so that i go and find that truly exceptional project manager or why is it so hard to find that exceptional project manager so I think we'll we'll talk we'll kind of go deeper on like the, the profile or the makeup or the traits of a good pm I have a good PM later, but to give you like a few, um, a few thoughts on why that's so challenging. The the first thing is that like, it kind of goes back to the point I just made, like the term has become watered down. So while people say I'm a project manager and look here, it says it right on my resume. And I, I did this for this other business. Um, it's like, you didn't, you just, you just, you just were given that title. So there's, there's a huge, like, um, there's, there's a reasonable amount of confusion about what we actually mean by that. And so people, as you talk to any builder and they'll tell you, 
oh yeah, this guy says he has four years of project management experience with this other business. I got him on site, doesn't have a clue, right? Like can't manage a budget, can't manage a schedule. Um, doesn't really understand building envelope very well. Um, doesn't communicate with the customer particularly well. Is not very good with, you know, Builder Trend or Job Nimbus or whatever platform we use. Um, and so I think I think that just like the the fact that this has become so watered down is part of why these people are so 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 difficult to difficult to find. Um, and that's why you know, we are a bigger fan of kind of building this in-house, like nurture these people, train these people, turn someone that is maybe um, uh, a little newer, a little less experienced into a good, a good project manager by, by having great infrastructure for them to work off of in the first place. Yeah, I, I love that. And I think I, I will get into this as we go in the conversation, but I think it's kind of a twofold thing at times as well, where you have to be willing to give some of that responsibility to your project managers. It's kind of, you know, it's not just a, Hey, we're slapping the title on there and it's a watered down thing. Mm -hmm. But a part of that is because, you know, owners hold close to the vest, the budgeting and the scheduling and some of those things where it's like, Hey, you are a project manager by title, but I've never actually given you those keys to, to sharpen those skills. Um, and that kind of takes me into my next question or where I want to get to for the owners, because I assume we have a lot of owners in this audience with us today. When they go look in the mirror, Benji, and they say, okay, what should I be looking for that maybe my, my systems and processes when it comes to project management aren't up to snuff? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what should they be looking for? Are there any telltale signs where it's like, yeah, that's, that's me. I can diagnose it myself. Like, like what, like what are the red flags? Like what, what you know, how, how do you know if your project management needs Exactly. Work? Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, okay. Cause like you, you do have to look in the mirror and you have to analyze your business and then it's like, okay, what are the total, totally. what, what should I be looking for here? Okay. So there's, there's, there's a couple things I can rattle off. Some are, some are obvious. Some are less obvious. The, I'll give you an obvious one first. So if you if a business's net profit is really low, like let's say it's between 2%, 4%, 5% net profit, um, that's like like annual net profit. That usually uh, it could be other things, but a lot of the, one of the first things that we check when we see that is the project management system. And there's a pretty simple reason for that. Um, you may have heard this saying, money, money loves speed, right? Um the best way to think of this is like your your business has fixed expenses that that absolutely need to be paid whether you build a lot that month or you build a little. So uh, your office, whether you rent it or you you own it, you're paying a mortgage. Your vehicle leases, um, the salaries of your management staff, your software subscriptions, the list goes on. There's a huge, you know, chart of accounts um, that are just sort of devoted to overhead uh, to fixed expenses. Now, poor project management leads to missed deadlines. It leads to things slowing down, getting bogged down. And what that means is that you produce less revenue and therefore gross profit and you need that gross profit to um, to cover those fixed expenses and then some so that it can create a healthy net. So this is a, I, I really love, I, I, we say this a lot in Breakthrough Academy, like your goal is to cram as much revenue through your overhead as possible. Right? Like that is, that is the difference between super profitable businesses. I'm talking 18% net, 22% net, 25% net in some really world-class cases. The difference between those businesses and everyone else is not, they just, they just charge an arm and a leg. It's not, they just have fancy customers and rich customers. I mean, they, they do have those things also, but if you really want to be analytical, um, and, and examine what they're doing. It's they cram more revenue through that overhead compared to everyone else. Um, and good good project management systems allow for that. So I'll give you like a, I'll can give you a super simple example, Gogan. okay? Company A, company B. Company A, okay, do $10 million a year in revenue. 
they have a 25% gross profit margin. And it, just to probably someone is like, what's gross profit? What's net? Too afraid to ask. Let me just explain. Gross profit is like what you make off of the project, off of the job. So you sell super simple numbers. You sell a job for $10,000 costs you $6,000 to build that job between your labor and your materials. You have a $4,000 gross profit off of that project. That gross profit then pays for your overhead. And then whatever's left over is your net quick, quick, uh, quick tutorial on gross versus net. Anyway, back to my example. 10 million in revenue, 25% gross profit margin, and 1.3 million in overhead that they need to spend every year to do that. Company B, because they have slightly better project management systems, they do 12 million. They're, they're able to do $2 million a year more because they get things done quickly. <clears throat> they do 12 million, same gross profit, 25%, same overhead, 1.3 million. If you do the math, right, you'll see company A makes 1.2 million net, whereas company B makes 1.7. Um, so if you look at that as a percentage, it's company A is getting 12% net, company B is doing 14. The point is good, good project management systems are the biggest factor that allows you to cram that revenue through your overhead and have all that trickle down to your bottom line. So net profit is a hugely important thing that we look at. And I would say that that's, a, that's especially a red flag for like what we call larger average job size contractors. So uh, if you're building custom homes, if you're doing large scale remodels, like where your projects are in the um, like hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, the, when we see low, low net with those businesses, it's like almost a guarantee that it's a project management. Uh, whereas if you're a smaller average job size contractor, let's say you're doing like roofing or landscaping or painting, your, your jobs are in the thousands or tens of thousands of uh, dollars. Uh, it's it's not always as clear a case, but with large AGS, it's 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 usually a, a pretty sure fire sign. Now, another thing, okay, if your gross profit doesn't hit your goal very consistently, in other words, when you if you like esti if you, when you estimate a job and you're like we're gonna make three grand on this project, and then but you're not you you're, it's not very reliable. Like you sometimes you make fifteen hundred, sometimes you lose money. Sometimes maybe you exceed, but it's very like randomized. Like you don't have the ability to sort of like estimate accurately and then produce in alignment with that estimate. That's another surefire sign that your that your PM systems are broken. Uh, third one would just be like schedules. So if you're um, if you're consistently off schedule, if you if you often take longer than you think you're going to take to complete something, usually goes back to project management. Um, and here's here's sort of like the 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 quintessential um one of the most obvious ones would be like they have no written details so like let us know in the chat box like how, how many of you guys have like a well-written sop for your project manager how many of you have like a clear employment agreement um clear quality control checklist a clear communication plan like there is there is written documentation and systemization around this specific role and the things that they need to do for most people for most businesses that we work with there would be there would be zero or there'd be like an there'd be sort of bare 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 minimum stuff that the business has built for that project manager so that i think that fourth one like no written details um is probably the most obvious because it's it's really difficult for them to lead effectively without a handle on labor materials budgets stuff like that at all times so yeah, I mean, just to summarize, low net profit, low growth profit, um, not very good at scheduling, you often go over time, uh, or if you have nothing written down, nothing written in place, those those to me would be like, those would be alarm bells, but okay, uh, that sounds like me, I probably need to work on my, my project management infrastructure. Yeah, I love those. And I would even take your your fourth one a step further, because I love what I'm presenting. And I, I present a lot on, you know, documentation of job sites and oftentimes I can get like half of the room to raise their hand and say that they you know have a standard operating procedure or they have a process for it and then I always challenge those owners hey if I brought one of your crew members in here would you be willing to bet a hundred dollars that they would be able to say that exact same process to me that you just said right. and so like, taking it a step further like yeah we got to get these things written down and then 
have to make sure that you're training those project managers and that it's, you know, in their blood that it's like, Hey, this is exactly how we run our jobs. Um, I, you know, I'd add something else to that too. One thing that like when we're, what we would consider like a world-class project manager, if we wanted to put some criteria around this, a project manager owns the budget They own the schedule and they own the client communication. So if you, the owner, own that stuff, like if you're making decisions based on the budget, if you're making decisions based on the schedule, if you're the one having most of the important conversations with the client, right? Your project manager, sadly, I hate, don't tell them this because it might hurt their feelings. They are essentially an errand boy. They are not, they might help. They might go get some stuff. They might organize some things on site they pick up some materials whatever they're they're not a project manager that, that would be like our sort of like def if they're not owning those those three things they are basically uh an overpaid errand boy um so that that'd be another just like th- thing to look at yeah. um yeah how often um not to take us on a tangent here but you know the first two points were very financial driven the third mm-hmm. point even like plays a big role in the finances. You know, if I'm running long on jobs, that's, you know, cost to me somehow Mm -hmm. um, financially. How often do you see people even just struggling to know their numbers? Because like, you know, I would venture to guess that maybe not not everybody on this, but there's people out there that when you're like, yeah, you got low gross profit. There's people Mm -hmm. like, I actually don't even know my gross profit. Mm -hmm. And just, Mm -hmm. is that something that you see as a problem where people are struggling with even just understanding their numbers of their business yeah i would say it's pretty a pretty wide pretty widespread thing within within construction and trade small business ownership like broadly speaking it's not even just this like i think that um talking about money looking at money looking at these numbers uh can be intimidating for people uh and i think that there's a huge gap when it comes to to people just having dashboards and having up-to-date accurate data on what is going on in their business there's a I, I, I can't I couldn't give you a percent a percentage because I've not done the research I can give you sort of my own anecdotal instinct on it I'd say probably half maybe even a little half bit was, more yeah. yeah half or more people are just like they're they're you know we say running it like by the gut right they're just like oh like I th- think it's about this and then they find out at the end of the year you know how, how they did good or bad um sadly more often than not it's bad if you're not if you're not on top of this stuff because what gets measured gets managed as we say um but yeah that's that's definitely a a huge challenge so to maybe add another point to that like none of this like we're talking about project management like i would not dive deep into this rabbit hole until you get the financial management handled first honestly there's, there's a good order like there's an order to these things like finances number one like get that in place first probably say do organizational structure second maybe a couple of the things this would be more an intermediate skill or an intermediate system if you don't have the basics down this is this is a this is not a, a good use of your time yeah absolutely and i not to give you guys a shameless plug but i asked that question because i've heard i've heard yourself i've heard danny speak a ton of times and you guys have loads of resources and knowledge there at breakthrough so you know if you're sitting here and you're saying like well benji told me that i need to uh, know my profit margin gross profit margin some of these things if you're saying i don't know those numbers yet get with Benji, get with the team at breakthrough after mm. this, because you guys can definitely help with those things as well. We don't have, we don't have time in this hour to solve those things. So we'll get back on track. But that was just, I just hearing that I was like, you know, if somebody's sitting there saying, I don't know my gross profit numbers, we got to have those steps in order to get to where we're doing good here. Yeah. It's, that's literally the first, that's the first, the first system we implement with our members is a really, really elaborate dashboard that shows them everything. Um, I just see, I just mentioned this a bunch of people in the in the chat box are like oh I'm haven't made haven't made these documents yet uh, I'm currently in the process I'm kind of working on it and I just to let you know guys stay, stay tuned like at the end of this talk in 35 minutes I'm going to send you to a landing page where you can download these systems I think Michael and I are going to talk about in a second you want a communication plan you want an employment agreement you want a GSR dashboard you want all these like sort of bare bones low hanging fruit PM systems we're, we're, we're going to give those away for free as a way of saying thanks for being here so if you're in the process of building this stuff i got a whole bunch of stuff that's going to save you a ton of hours 
um, in building this. Yeah, we got a question in here. I think it fits kind of what we were sure. talking about in the telltale signs of or the red flag sign of things, but maybe even the flip side of that where like, hey, what are the you know world-class businesses doing when it comes to project management? But question is, is it smart or a mistake to have one person carrying out the cost estimation, handle the PO system, scheduling, uh, handle contractors or subcontractors and purchasing? Um, mm -hmm. um, it's not, it's not smart or like, that's, I don't know, like it's sort of an interesting way to ask that question. I would just say like, I ideally Mirza, you would have, you would, you would not have so much, um, bundled into one role. Like a lot of, a lot of the times when we have this conversation, people, people say, um, you know, should I have my like project, should I have my PM also doing estimation and sales? When it, when you look at scalability, you, you want to create increasingly more defined lanes for people. And so the, you know, the, the sort of the, the textbook, like, you know, management consultant answer to this would be like, you should have, those should be defined roles. Those should actually be different people in time the real on the boots answer. And we, I can say this cause I've, I've run a business like yours, like is you can't always afford that. Those people aren't always available. And so there are chapters in your business's story where you're probably going to have to have someone wearing two hats or wearing three hats. You'd like to over time, Mirza move in the direction where you have, you know, in different individuals owning those responsibilities for you. That, that would make scalability more easy, but I understand when your business is younger, you're more junior as an entrepreneur, that's not always possible. And so I would say, you know, do your best with what you have, but, but over time, move in the direction where you can, where you can define those two roles for, for different people or those three roles for three different people. It's yeah. a great question. Yeah. Yeah. That great answer as well, Benji. I think, I think the one thing I would add to that is just making sure you understand the plan too. Like, Hey, as we start to scale, what, what hats can John maybe take off and we're going to give to this new role of lead mm -hmm. estimator or whatever that is. So I think that's, mm -hmm. that's great as well. Mark even brought that up. Like, you know, it depends on scale. How, where are you guys at in the process? Mm. Yeah. I see on, that. That's on how that's many just cats. It. Yep. Yeah, so Mark's right. Yeah. Let's, let's then like continue to even focus a little bit on these companies that you've worked with that do a really awesome job with project mm. management. Yeah. And at the same time, kind of think about like, so assuming that this is a problem that is solvable, you know, mm -hmm. what are some things that we can do in our business to fix it, to get to where, you know, those world-class businesses are at? Because those world-class businesses probably are have solved those things themselves at some point in time. They mm -hmm. didn't just magically start being perfect at project management. So like, what can we do to solve these problems to, and they maybe even give some examples of what the, the world-class you know, businesses that you work with are doing? Sure. That's kind of a two-part question. So let's just talk about like what world-class looks like and feels like. The, the first thing that I can say with, with some authority, because we do have like many, many, many examples of this within the Breakthrough Academy world is these businesses make a lot of money. Like I'll be explicit, like they make a lot of money. Okay. Their net profit is very, very high. They're enjoying, um, they're enjoying a highly profitable company, whether they build custom homes, whether they remodel kitchens and bathrooms, whether they create expansive landscapes, whatever it is, like they usually are the most profitable in the bunch. And then there's some other like sort of secondary benefits. Their, their teams are not super stressed out. You don't have your project managers who are red in the face and like you know, their cortisol levels are spiked, you know, every hour of every day, people aren't exhausted. Things feel more controlled. They feel more calm and peaceful. Generally speaking, your clients are a lot happier. So you'll see the quality of the client and contractor relationship increase, get better through the life cycle of the project. People are like, what? Like, that's insane. Usually when I finish projects, we're sick of each other. When you have really good PM systems, like you're usually closer with your client by the end. It's not to say the project was 100% perfect and nothing, nothing, you know, um, nothing went off without a hitch. You, you, you may still have had hiccups along the way, but, but because there's, there's, there's a really good process for this, um, you, you would enjoy those things. So making more money, 
teams less stressed out, clients are happier. Uh, probably five or six other things we could dive into if we had time. So that's um, that's what it that's that's kind of like what's at stake here. Um, as far as as far as uh, like this the the low hanging fruit or like what you know what to do to to move the needle in this direction is kind of four things um, that we would consider like very entry level project management systems. This is not. If someone has a PhD in this and they're watching this webinar, they might go, oh, that's not everything. You can do lots more. And they'd be right. But if I'm talking to people who are just like just starting to dive down this rabbit hole in their business, what I think, what we think would be really important for people at that stage would be number one, really well done employment agreement. So like project manager employment agreements, a GSR dashboard, number two. Number three would be like clear communication plans. And then number four would be project status updates. That would be like the, the most readily available systems to implement. And we can dive into those if you want, Gogan. Yeah, I would love to. Um, let's start at the top there. Like what needs to go into that, that employment agreement? Okay. Can I screen share? Yeah, absolutely. Let's... Uh... Let's see what we got here. Great. So a good employment agreement, a lot of people, like this is probably not the most, uh, this is pretty simple stuff. Like I'm not, I'm not going to pretend that this is like uh, coming out of the, the lab at, at Tesla. This is a, this is a nice clean word document, nothing fancy, but it works extremely well when a business does not have employment agreements. And not just for project managers, but for all the roles in the business, for laborers, for office managers, for estimators, even the owner should have one. You'll see a lot of see a lot of uh, finger pointing. So people will be like, I thought that was your job. Um, and then in other areas, you'll see uh, like the duplication of tasks. There's a lot of redundancy because two people are doing the same thing and they don't they don't know. Um, so that when we this is like one of the simplest things you can do to in inject your business with, with clarity and with structure. So a good employment agreement, this will be available in the downloads, by the way, should have a few things. Company values at the top. Always start with that. Like always, always lead with your values. Do you guys, if there's some of you that have great company values that you're proud of, throw those in the chat box. Then you'd get into like deliverables and accountability. So what are the actual results that this project manager needs to achieve? Um, so if I was, let's say I was a builder, I'd, I'd go in here and I'd say, okay, I want, I want my PM to produce $2.5 million in revenue a year. And I'd like them to achieve, uh, I'd like them to achieve like a 35% gross profit margin. I want them to maintain a nine out of 10 on the quality score. You could change these as much as you want. You can make these to be whatever deliverables you think are important for your business. But we always we always anchor our employment agreements with some results focus. So it's not just a brain dump, a laundry list of a bunch of tasks. You start with this is how we measure success. This is what we think good looks like for your role as a project manager. And these deliverables would look different for different types of positions. But that's where we would start. Then we would get into accountabilities, which would sort of, now it is the task list. Now we do go through the laundry list of things they need to do, but these accountabilities are pinned on each individual deliverable. So for the um, for the uh, on-budget and on-schedule deliverable, this is all the stuff they need to do. For the other one, here's all the stuff they need to do. You get into um, reporting structure. So who do they report to on what, how often, how do they get paid? How do they get bonused? probably going to have a bunch of questions about compensation in a bit. Um, and then you'd have sort of like general expectations, like hours worked and benefits and travel, et cetera. So this would be like, if I'm, if I'm thinking like square one for this, having a good employment agreement in place, defining their role in writing, not just some like verbal understanding where you have this, you know, loose idea of, what people do and it's kind of communicated orally it's it's in writing it's on paper it's read through and it's it's signed off on at the bottom at the end of the at the beginning of the year rather you literally sign off here saying i get it i know what i'm here to do um people talk a lot about accountability how do i hold my people accountable 
Uh, it's very difficult to hold your people accountable to a line you never drew in the first place. And so uh, employment agreements really solve that for you very easily. Um, so that'd be the first thing. Make sense? Loved it. Yeah. Um, any questions? No, it looks like we're good. We're, we're good. So. Eric, Eric does have a question, but let's get through the four okay, here. Sure. Um, and we'll get that answered as well. Sure. Um, so those are employment agreements. After that, um, the next like really fundamental system, this is a little cooler. Uh, employment agreements are important, but they, they, you know, they sometimes can be a little dry. I get it. This I think is actually really cool. So back to the accountability piece, right? It's like, okay, make an employment agreement. It's nice and detailed. There's some numbers at the top. There's like a laundry list of tasks. Cool. Good for you. Do you think that if somebody just reads off this thing and signs on the dotted line that all of a sudden your problems are solved? No, like you, you would be delusional. You'd be kidding yourself. So that's where the actual like week to week management comes in. And so this is something we called a GSR dashboard. GSR stands for goal setting and review. So goal setting and review meeting is like, you know, I'm just gonna, let me just pull off screen share. I wanna set some context around this. This is something that you, the owner, would do with your key roles on a weekly basis. You, you could get away with bi-weekly, but you monthly would not be often enough. It is a one-on-one -on -one meeting that ideally you do every week with, let's say, uh, your project manager, your office manager, and your sales manager. It's just to use a super sort of like, basic business example. And in these meetings, it is it is prepared for by that key role. So the PM would come into their dashboard on a Friday afternoon and they would fill it out. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. You would then do your prep as the owner. Uh, and then you would on the following Monday, you guys would get together and have a very results focused, performance focused discussion about where this individual is at against their goals, which are where they are clearly articulated in the employment agreement. So this is how we connect sort of like week to week activity to that annualized set of deliverables. Okay, so here's the example, right? Deliverables up here, 2.5 million in production. We got our company values up here, family first, be honest, be respectful, be accountable, schedule and budget, customer service, all that stuff from the employment agreement. Now what you now what the, the, the PM goes through is they actually have a little dashboard to provide some insight in writing about how the projects they're managing are going. So in this example, let's say this guy's name is Tim. Tim is managing three projects. He's managing the, the Thompson house, which is a $765,000 contract. He's running the Lang project, about half a million, just under 500K. And then he's got a smaller remodel for the Whitakers at 80 grand. And within these projects, he has a clear target gross profit he'd like to hit, right? Uh, and then there's a few other data points. It's like, where are you, what percentage do you complete on this project? Well, on this one, we're about 26%. Are you on schedule? Are you on, on your, are, are you on budget? And where are you at against your milestones? And so this is basically a live document. You can see I have this in Excel. I would recommend actually uploading this to your Google Drive and having it be like a cloud-based sheets document so that you guys can collaborate and work on stuff together. But this would get updated every week so that the PM and the owner can have a very concise and data-focused touch point about where that PM is at against his goals. And then you, the owner, can support that person in the way that they need. So there's a couple of things that this does. Number one, I actually think that a lot of business owners are way less plugged in to what's happening in their business than they think they are. Like they're kind of overconfident about how much they know about the 10 projects or the 12 sites they have open. So it solves that. So you're super plugged in. It allows you to support and coach your team a lot better. Um, it makes your people feel very supported and it really drives accountability for the simple reason that your project manager knows, yeah, this guy's like, this guy's on my shit. Like this guy's on top of it. Like I have to, I have to report in on this data every single week. Um, I better get my ass in gear. It's not like a threatening way. It's like a very healthy sort of like, like high performance culture type way. And so GSR meetings are how we connect 
long-term goals, annualized goals to like week to week activity. That's how you lead people throughout the year. So that would be the second system that I think is really important. Um, you want me to just keep moving along? Yeah, I think, I think it's perfect. Okay. I love the, these second two are a little quicker to get a little, a little quicker to get through. So the third thing that I mentioned guys is something we call a project communication plan. <clears throat> you talk to <clears throat> most owners about this they'll be like no nah, like we we communicate like we're good like i'm not afraid to have a tough conversation like we we it's like we talk all the time it's like <laughs> okay just because you have 60 million phone calls on your you know your phone record every day does it actually doesn't mean you're communicating well at all it just means you it just means you have a lot of phone calls um and so a project communication plan essentially articulates the meeting rhythm that you need to have with the key stakeholders of the project. So who are those? It's homeowners. It's the project manager. Um, sub trades. It could be an architect. It could be the city. It could be an interior designer. There's going to be a whole host of people who are involved in some capacity with this project. And a project communication plan essentially lays out when you're going to talk to these people uh, about what you're going to speak with them on. It's not just like randomized conversations. Like it is actual, it is an actual like, Hey, with the, <clears throat> with the homeowner, we need to talk about these things. These this often the architect is something else. And so this is a super easy to like fill in the blanks template that just allows you to like premeditate when these, when these meetings happen gives you a purpose an outcome and an agenda for each meeting and it dramatically increases the quality of your communication while decreasing the volume which i think a lot of business owners would probably like to see i'd like to talk on the phone a little less everyone would and this, this is a great way to do it um the fourth thing is something we call a project status update um again pretty simple this is this is much more just for the just for the homeowners so um effective PMs would mandate that these take place with the client. It's not optional. You client has to take part in project status updates um, every one to two weeks. If you have maybe a more neurotic, like high attention to detail customer, you do them weekly. If you have someone that's a little more hands-off, do them bi-weekly. Um, but your discussion points in a project status update are to talk about the budget, to talk about the schedule and to talk about key decisions with the client. So if you, um, one of the, one of like the number one reasons people's relationships deteriorate, uh, client contract relationships deteriorate, change orders are not communicated effectively. So, so at the end of the project, you kind of go and say, Hey, Oh, just by the way, we need an extra 30 grand. It's like, that sucks for the homeowner. Um, you're going to have a hard time collecting on that too. So if you have changes to the budget, if change orders have happened, um, homeowners decided to go with a fancier set of cabinets, for example, and that doesn't get captured and then relayed to the customer proactively, you are going to have a whole bunch of issues downstream. Schedule, same thing. It's like people, if, if you're going to be a month behind, you should know that well in advance and that should be communicated to the client and then key decisions, right? So if, if you have selection, if you're at a stage in the project where selections need to be made, you need to let the homeowner know about that. Customers are indecisive, right? Oh, let's think about it for freaking three weeks and like really hum and haw over basic stuff. If you've, you know, I'm sure a lot of you on this call would, would have <laughs> been frustrated by that before. Um, if you can sort of plant seeds early on and say, Hey, we do need to know about this two weeks out. Can you guys, you know, start looking at X, Y, Z and come up with a decision in the next 10 days. Uh, so that would be uh, it's you know very quick summary on, on what a project status update meeting looks like. Here's the template for that. Um, this is pretty intuitive. If you guys open this up on your computer at home, you'll, you'll figure out pretty quickly how, how this works. Um, and so these, these four things really help make, uh, again, it's not the be all end all. This is not the exhaustive formula of all project management systems. But when we look at construction companies, we look at trades companies, we look at home service companies, that's the low hanging fruit. That's, that's the stuff that I think people need to start with. And I'd even make a, a 
I'd make another comment. If you're nowhere on this, if you have nothing in place, I would start with the employment agreement, the GSR dashboard. Do that for six months, maybe even a year. Just focus on that. Get that stuff really humming for you. Get that stuff really working for you. And then go to the communication plan and the project status update. Um, so those would be four things. I, I think I think that that really moved the needle where this is concerned. Love it. Love it. Mm -hmm. And again, I love the all of the downloads and deliverables you guys have at BTA. Mm -hmm. Um, so going over that, you know, talking about how do I diagnose, what does it look like to be world-class, you know, how do I solve this problem? We talked about the actual aspect of project management. We mm. talked slightly earlier on, you know, finding the right person for that role. Um, what do I, what do I need to be looking for in that ideal candidate's profile? I know you mentioned, you know, growing them from within your organization, maybe touch a little bit on, you know, what does that profile look like when I get them in as some other entry level role? How do I maybe identify them and say, I'm going to nurture them. I think they'd be a good project manager. Sure. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Eric's got a great question here on SOPs too. Let's circle back to that. after. Yep. Yep. So question is about who, who makes a good PM. Um, I don't know, guys, why don't I, I'm going to like go through this. Why don't you like brain some brain dump some stuff in the chat box while I'm kind of going through my thoughts on this. I'd love to compare notes. This is not, um, <laughs> I'm going to preface what follows by saying like, a lot of this stuff is, is <sighs> there is no, like people are not robots, right? So it's, it's not like, a, it, I wish they were sometimes, but it's not, this is, these are sort of like loose guidelines to follow some things to think about some, some traits to interview for you. You're not always going to have someone that sort of has every single trait per, in, in the perfect quantity and perfect balance. You do usually need to make some sacrifices here or there. But if I, if I were to describe a few things that I think are really important and please dump in the chat box, what you think is important, there's, Four things that come to mind. So the first is, is a trait we call instrumental. So instrumental is, um, uh, this is BTA terminology here, but we, we define instrumental as the ability to come across to others as highly competent and presentable. So um, are you articulate? Do you have a good vocabulary? Is your posture, is your body language one that is like sort of open and confident and smooth? If you think of a really good salesperson, um, they usually have a really high, high instrumental. You have a really high instrumental go. Like when you get up and speak on stage, you're very confident, you use your hands well. You it's like that, that is what we can that's how we would define instrumentals. Like, can they communicate ideas effectively? And do they come across as someone that is confident in the world? Right. Why is this important for a PM? So the really like on the job site, the buck stops with them. They need to convey confidence to the customer, to their sub trades, to the in-house labor on site, to anyone else involved with the project. And a PM role is so communication heavy versus like labor heavy, like other roles are labor heavy. Project management is fundamentally a communication heavy role. You need to be a very strong communicator. And so instrumental would be really high on the list. Number two would be something we call problem solving. Pretty obvious. Um, if anyone here has worked with someone that, that, that scores low when it comes to problem solving, um, it can be pretty frustrating. Like your phone rings a lot with what you feel like are pretty stupid, like pretty stupid questions. Oh, like, uh, hey, Benji, like the, you know, the house is on the, is on a hill and like the, I can't get the ladder up and like, can you come to site? And it's like, bro, like, can you like, can you try and figure this out first? Can you, can you give me a, give me a few solutions maybe that you thought of? So problem solving is, is the ability to find solutions to problems and look at challenges in a positive attitude, in a positive attitude. Um, as a project manager, your entire job is solving problems. If, if projects went perfectly, if they sort of, if every time you, <laughs> built the built the project plan and the schedule they just went off without a hitch every single time we wouldn't need project managers but they don't and so that's why this role exists in the first place and so if you don't if you score low on that 
I think that's a pretty obvious one. I'll just actually make a really quick aside on problem solving guys. This is a kind of good little coaching tip that I, um, I, uh, I pulled from, uh, one of our, one of our senior, um, construction coaches, his name is Paul. He, he gave me this bit. I think it's so good. I've used it a lot. If you want to train your staff to be good problem solvers. Okay. Here's what you do. <clears throat> when your people come to you with problems, whatever it is, big or small. Okay. You ask them three questions every time, write this down. What is the issue? Most of the time when people are venting, they're upset, they're coming to you with problems. They don't even understand the root issue. Like they have, no, they're just, they're just like, they're just mouthing off about something. So what is the issue? First and foremost, second question in your professional opinion, what are three potential ways to solve the issue? There you go. Start thinking, start coming up with stuff. Question number three, if I was stuck on a desert island right now and you could not talk to me, what path would you put forward to solve this? Okay, you ask people these three questions. Number one, they're going to start thinking about the, they're going to start thinking about root causes. Number two, they're going to use the cre. I saw someone post in the chat box, a creative problem solving, creative thinking. They're going to use that creative part of the brain to come up with potential solutions. And then usually they're going to be forced through this thought exercise to pick one. 90% of the time, what they're going to come up with isn't any better than what you could come up with yourself. It's, it's going to be adequate. It's going to be good enough. Sometimes it might even be better than what you can come up with. And that little exercise over time, it's not going to happen overnight, but over the course of six months, a year, your people, you, you start to cultivate a problem solving culture within your team. Yeah. While you're on your but, side there, Benji, one thing sure. I would add is just keeping in mind your point one was you have to be a great communicator mm. and how often am I going to run into as a project manager, a solution where it's adequate, maybe adequate at best. And now I have to really leverage my communication skills to everybody that's on this job. And I've got to be confident in selling like, Hey, this is how we're going to accomplish this. Even if in the back of my mind, I'm saying, Oh shoot, this, this can be tough. Like, Hey, I'm yeah. confident about this. I'm sure about this. I'm communicating it well. This is what we're going to do. I'm an authoritarian, you know, I feel good about it. I'm confident. And so I think that's that's a really interesting order here where you're like communication first. And then it's like, oh, we're into this problem solving piece second. Yeah, I, that, that instrumental, that instrumental one where we talk about like, are you confident and are you articulate? Like, do you come across as competent to people? Um, that, you know, there's a reason that that's so important for salespeople. And there's a reason it's so important for project managers. The overlap between the two is a salesperson is selling a job, is selling a project, is selling a product. A project manager is usually selling solutions to their, to the client. I think this is going to work. I really think this is going to work. Or the, and then there's, and then they're also selling it to, you know, the people that have to go and execute. So there's a lot of persuasion involved in being a good a good pm just a, an interesting point two other things guys just when, when i think about this uh really high degree of tenacity so tenacity is um like someone's preference to overcome challenges through pure hard work like are they gritty can they just like can they put their head down and get their ass in gear and finish something can they work a long day when they have to um uh why well because you need to be a bulldog to do this well right? You need to have a get it done mindset, a laissez faire approach to this just will not work if you care about making money. Uh, furthermore, you have a whole bunch of people on site looking up to you, they're taking cues from you. And so if you're like, you know what, guys, it's Friday, let's, um, let's call it a day, like that is that will accumulate over time. Last thing I would say would be core values like you. Yeah. And that's, just, that's, that's true of any role. You need to have very, very strong core values alignment. If you've ever worked with a project manager who is not values aligned with you or your business, big problems. Um, I just make a couple other points on this about who makes a good project manager. Okay. Um, you, you have this saying, I, I don't know if we, we invented this or if someone else did, but we say it a lot in BTA. Don't let, the, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. Don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. So unless you're launching rockets into space, you don't need someone with off the charts attention to detail. You don't need someone that is like crazy OCD or crazy anal about details. In construction, 
99% of the time getting with some exceptions, but the vast majority of the time getting it done is way more important than getting it perfect. So you have someone that fusses over things to an extreme degree that can actually be a huge problem. You think it's going to be good. Um, but for the sake of your business and its profitability and scale, it's actually not good. It can really slow things down. Um, other thing I'd really ask business owners to be really mindful of or really open to would be considering people that come from outside the industry. You do not need to be a construction guru with 30 years under your belt and know every technical detail and tool and product out there. You don't, you know, your site super can do that. Some of your lead, your lead laborers, your carpenters on site can have that. You, the owner can have that. The project manager's job is to what? Manage a budget, manage a schedule, communicate with the client. They need to have some information. They need to have some um, knowledge, but that stuff can be trained. And so we've had a lot of success finding PMs from dentist's office, from marketing companies, from um, hospitality, from tourism, like from totally first time in construction, they've come in, they've taken on a PM role and they're absolutely crushing it. So you don't want to be totally cavalier about it. Um, but don't don't think that you need to have someone with a like they need to have a black belt in construction, um, not the case. So anyway, I'll I'll pause there because I've been rambling on for a while. But th those would be those would be my thoughts on uh, on what makes a good PM. I'm curious to see the chat box and hear what other people think. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And kind of let's let's use the chat box and Q and A here as we kind of just bring this to a to a close. Ultimately, I think talking about you know what what makes a good PM trait wise is a great place. Uh, but right now we can kind of answer questions as well as they're coming in. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously we alluded to it earlier, but those that are going to want to dive deeper on this topic, because we are limited to roughly an hour, um, mm -hmm. you've got some deliverables there as well and downloads for them. So um, let's kind of do all of that stuff um, sure. here as we, as we put a bow on this. I do want to get to Eric's question. This is something I actually really enjoy is when creating SOPs, do you create drafts, present that to the team, hone in and complete, or do you say, here's the SOP. This is what we're going to be doing. Such a great question, Eric. I've, uh, I'm having a guy, uh, I'm having someone come on the podcast to talk about this exact thing. So three, really, really, I'm going to answer this question in three parts. I'll be brief though. Number one, the first thing that you have to get right when implementing the SOP is the standard. Like that's the like standard operating procedure. You have to get the standard right. Okay. Going back to my comment earlier, you, the owner, probably don't know as much about your business as you think you do. You want to write an SOP for how to do things on a job site. You're not the, you are not the authority figure on this. The people on the job site are. So it's, you definitely don't do the, the second part of your question. You don't create it top down and then say, this is what we're doing. Right. Cause what happens? They go, cool. I don't care. Like whatever. Nice SOP, dude. I hope it looks like you had fun building that all weekend. I'm going to go back to my job now. So this is a leadership exercise. You crowdsource it. You involve them in the build out. You explain to them why this SOP makes their life easier, why it's going to improve the business. And then you lead them through the process of brain dumping, organizing their thoughts, getting it built into something that they were involved in creating. Then you have, then you have buying. There's a problem with people creating SOPs. Everyone's like, I made it. And no one follows it. It's like, that's because no one cares. Like they weren't, they didn't make it themselves. It's like, when you're a kid, like the best Lego sets were the ones that you created with your own mind, not the ones that came out of the box. It's the same thing with making SOPs. Like people want to feel like their creative juices are in that SOP. Then they'll follow it. Not only that, they'll actually sell it to the new people that come on behind them. They'll be like, I made this. I want you to follow this process. So get them involved. Don't write it yourself. Second thing you need to have is it needs to be very easy to access. That's why we like things like company cam or like tools where it's like it can be stored digitally. It can be accessed through your phone. A 64-page binder with rings that sits in the truck, no one's going to see it. It's going to collect dust all year. We know this. So it's easy to access. And the third thing is it's easy to update. Your business evolves. Processes improve. If these are like these static things that get written once and never updated, right, that's a problem because businesses change and they, they get better at things. They become more efficient. So you need to have, uh, it needs to be very easy to amend things and improve them over time. 
uh, so I hope that answered that question, Eric, to go deeper on that tune into the podcast in about six weeks, we're going to, we're going to have a really great conversation (laughs) on that. I love that answer. And I also, the only thing I would add to that is I think about having, having children and picking where we're going to go eat. And if you, (laughs) if you set it up correctly in your SOP, there's probably things that you're like, Hey, this really has to be in the SOP from my, from my perspective as an owner. It's like when I'm picking that, it's like, Hey guys, we're either going to go to Chick-fil-A tonight or Runza. I know we got some local Nebraskans in here. Um, but I want to let you guys make that decision, you know, and it's like, I'm empowering them to make a decision, but I've narrowed it down. I'm like, I'm not going to McDonald's. Like that's not part of this procedure, but you're empowered to make the actual final decision. And so I think some of those things are important as well as like, what do you as the owner feel has to be in the SOP and make sure that you get that in there as well. People uh, got- always talk. Yeah. So, you know, it's fine. I could totally get on a rabbit hole. I know we're <laughs> I, running out of time. I know yeah. we got, we got tons of great, uh, great questions here. Um, t- two of them kind of around the compensation and the financial end of things. Um, but working, you know, obviously we could talk for hours on compensation and the financial end, but where can I go to, you know, get some of these financial lesson plans or educational plans to, grow as an owner, grow my team and their knowledge of some of the terminology. Um, also on that same thing for uh, Brenna, you know, what, what do, where do I go to figure out how do I pay these people? How do I compensate? Um, come to Breakthrough Academy. Uh, come work with us. If you don't want to work with us, check out our podcast called Contract Revolution. This is literally all we talk about. It's free content. There's no ads. Um, we, we, you know, we, we BTA have created, I think really like a, a tremendous amount of, of, of content that's widely distributed and, and totally available for you guys to educate yourself and then educate your team on this stuff. Um, so I ho- hope that answers your question. Yeah. I, in fact, you know what, just, just be, I'm looking at the time here. I don't, I usually you see a pretty big exit at the top of the hour guys. I just want to, um, show you something really quick. I've mentioned these things, these, um, these uh, employment agreements, project status updates, communication plans, GSR dashboard, all that stuff. Um, we, cause we're like Canadian and way too nice. We give all of our stuff away for free. We're just like, here, have it. We don't care. Um, I'm just joking. Uh, we, there's a lot more where this came from, uh, but we would love to just sort of say as a way to say, thanks for being here. We care about you. We want you to do well in your business. Go to trybta.com slash PM. So I'm going to, I'm going to copy this and I'm uh, going to put it in the chat box. I got you. It, you got, okay. Trybta.com slash PM. That's going to take you to a landing page where you put in your information, your email, and you hit send me my templates and we will send you a download pack. If you want to, if you want to connect with me, you want to connect with someone from the team, you want to talk about project management in your business and where it's at or other stuff. You want to talk about your hiring funnel or you want to talk about your strategic plan or you want to talk about your profitability uh, numbers and why they aren't where you want them to be. Come do, we kind of joke, we call us like, uh, we call it like therapy for business owners. If you want to just like, like sit on a couch and talk about your feelings about your business, like that, we would love to do that. So um, book a strategy session with us. And on that same landing page, there's going to be a, there's going to be a button where you can say, send me the templates and let's talk about how you can help my business. That will allow you to schedule a call with us and we'll get, we'll get to know you. These webinars are great, but they're, they are ultimately kind of one-sided. I'd love to just like not talk and listen to you talk about your business. So if you want to do that, you can check that box that says, send me the templates and let's talk about how you can help my business. And then lastly, for you guys, I saw a bunch of you guys asking this. Um, if you want to educate your team, you want to educate yourself, you'd like to go, this is a one hour webinar, right? So we don't have time to do everything. If you want to go deeper on this, you check out Contract Revolution. It's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Spotify, it's on YouTube, it's everywhere. Uh, and we have a lot of great project management episodes, episode 21, episode 28, episode 38, five to name three. There's lots more. Go check out the show. There's a lot of good free information uh, on that. So that's my shameless plug. Back to questions. Yeah. Um, so one great one that I want to, I think we can answer collectively um, Paul asked about company cam offering or developing additional resources 
to assist with PMs. Uh, great question because Benji and I, before we went live, we're talking about the new templated lists that we have in company cam in the marketplace. And honestly, I, I could see us getting some of, you know, BTAs downloads and free things that they're giving out built into company cam so that while you're in the field, you're not having to go through your Google drive and find something that you can, you know, kind of go through that. And so the, the fourth one there on the project status up, update, like, I think we could do a lot of that stuff for these contractors and really help your, your PMs with that. So absolutely something there, you can create them yourself, but we want to leverage our great relationships that we have one being with BTA to get you all those resources as well. Um, question here, I don't want to speak for you, but not in construction, but involved with construction and insurance inspection, uh, more of a service company. Uh, do 20,000 jobs, would that be a fit for BTA? Totally. Uh, not in construction. Yeah. Yeah. We, we work with a lot of, uh, we lurk, work with a lot of businesses that are in, that are in sort of the insurance realm, whether that's like your storm roofer, your insurance roofer. Um, we work with a few public adjusters. We like, we, we, we let's, let's do a call Darius. Let's, Absolutely. let's, let's that, talk outside of this. I again, have a feeling I, it'd probably work. Yeah. I didn't want to speak for you, Benji, but I was like, essentially, you know, B2C, you're helping those contractors, but a B2B that is doing the same stuff, you know, I think there's a ton of value there. Um, the only other thing I think that we have other than, um, oh, get make sure Darius could yeah. get a call. Darius, post. you're going to, I'm going to post it again, right below you go to trybta.com slash PM. Oh, dang, this chat box doesn't create that into a link. So you actually need to copy that, paste it into your browser, go to that landing page, and then check the box that says, send me my templates and let's talk about how you can help my business. And that will allow you to book a meeting with, with us. Perfect. And then the only other thing that I think we have out there is a few people asking about the recording that will be available, should be available um, tomorrow at some point. Uh, you should get all that via email. It also will be on companycam.com slash webinars. So I, I'm guessing Benji or Danny's art got other resources on our webinars page as well. So lots of good webinars and content on there. Um, and then Kevin asked about certificates of attendance or credit hours. Uh, to my knowledge, we don't have anything there. Um, but if there's an idea that you have, Kevin, we would, I think both of us be, be happy to um, dive deeper into that. This one we don't have, we can tell people that you came, but we don't have any, uh, credit hours available for this but always something we're open to so i think we've got everybody taken care of um benji as always i appreciate it man um, it's been a pleasure absolutely uh like i said we had some we've had some huskers in the audience today uh benji came and watched the basketball game i keep telling him he's got to come watch uh watch a football game at the mecca so we'll keep pushing on him get him down to lincoln for uh for a football game this fall but to all you in attendance go really huskers have, go huskers go big red um we appreciate you guys joining us and again huge shout out to benji uh and breakthrough academy so thank you all and we will see you next month for for another round of webinar thanks guys bye see you guys